why and how did Donald McLean, the son of a knighted British cabinet minister, become one of the most successful KGB agents of all time? The man's life was wild. Did he join one of the most secretive and successful spy rings for the alcohol but stay for the orgies? Or was he motivated by idealism? Stay tuned to find out more. We are not professing to tell you the complete story of these activities. We are professing to tell you the complete story that we know. These records that we've uncovered don't tell the story. This is CIA Files. They tell pieces of it. True stories of U.S. intelligence. This is your host, Brandon Givens, helping you uncover the truth from the lies, sorting the facts from the fictions. Donald McLean was a key figure in one of the most infamous espionage cases of the 20th century. As a member of the Cambridge Five, a group of British spies recruited by the Soviet Union during World War II, McLean played a significant role in passing classified information to the Soviets. His actions had far-reaching consequences for intelligence operations and national security. This biography explores the life and activities of Donald McLean, shedding light on his motivations, the impact of his betrayal, and how he met his end. Donald Duar McLean was born on May 25, 1913, in London, England. His father, the knighted Sir Donald Fitzroy McLean, was a well-respected British politician. He was president of the now-defunct Liberal Party from 1923 to 1926, and also served in the cabinet of His Majesty's government. The Liberal Party of Great Britain was liberal in the sense that it supported free trade, open markets, and expanding the vote and democratic institutions while reducing the power of the crown and monopolies. They were liberal in the classical sense. His mother, Gwyneth, came from a very well-off Welsh family. They were the limousine liberals of the time, or limousine libertarian-ish. The young Donald McLean grew up with his father, who was open to going against British tradition, but who held beliefs that would be considered conservative by American political traditions, such as free trade. The point is, going against the grain seemed to be in his blood. He came to age during the turbulent times after World War I. Think Pinky Blinders, if you've seen it. Of course, he wasn't hanging with the regular people, but he was aware of their plight and complexities of the labor movement. Great Britain was a politically tense place, a topic we'll revisit. The power of the hereditary aristocracy and tradition was falling. Change, even when asked for, always brings some level of discomfort or disorder as new institutions are formed. Change in and of itself often precedes revolutions or at least social upheaval. As with change, there are new winners and new losers, and people feel they lose their place. People will talk about the good old days before when things were simpler, or people knew what to expect. As a child, McLean attended Gresham's school at Holt. This is one of England's oldest and British English public schools and American English private schools. It was founded in 1555 by Sir John Gresham and meant to replace the school operated by the Catholic Church before Henry VIII seized Catholic Church property. The school today, and at the time McLean attended, was an exclusive and prestigious boarding school with a reputation for admitting worthy students from lower income backgrounds. The connections made at this school become important for not just McLean, but others as well. 
To provide context for McLean's recruitment, I must sidestep for a bit to discuss two other characters, James Klugman and Arnold Deutsch. See, another future spy for the Soviets attended Gresham and Cambridge with McLean, James Klugman. Klugman, however, is not considered to be one of the Cambridge Five. How close McLean and Klugman were in childhood is an open question, but their lives collide again at university. Klugman was involved in recruiting McLean. Klugman was Jewish and the son of a successful tobacco pipe merchant. His sister was a communist and married a prominent Marxist philosopher, Maurice Cornforth. The family was as bougie as they come. This shouldn't be a surprise. Ingalls, who bankrolled Marx, was a very well-off bourgeoisie. It's a common theme for well-off capitalists, especially those born to the wealth, to philosophically support Marxism. Perhaps they feel they don't deserve the wealth. Perhaps they see the exploitation of labor firsthand and truly desire to do something about it. In reality, it's probably just the result of having the money to support the free time to ask questions about the nature of the system. Revolutions are quite often led not by an oppressed and organized poor, but an intellectual elite who've had the time to think about and study questions of economics and government. In any event, as McLean grew up with libertarianish politics about reducing state power, Klugman grew up comfortable with discussions about class struggle. Klugman joined the Communist Party while attending Cambridge. He worked with Arnold Deutsch, who was the London head of recruitment for the NKVD, which became the KGB. Klugman was an open communist, so he wasn't used directly for spying, or at least he was used carefully. Deutsch did use him to connect with John Cairncross and the other Cambridge Five, and no doubt those old Gresham ties to McLean were helpful. Speaking of helpful Gresham ties, during World War II, Klugman was recruited by General Terence Airy to join the British Special Operations Executive. This group was a British espionage group that organized guerrilla warfare behind enemy lines. Now, you might be asking yourself how a known communist came to be working with British special operations. Well, General Terence Airy was also a graduate of Gresham, and the MI5 records on Kluckman had been destroyed in a German air raid. So there was no official record of his communist activities when a background check was conducted, and he had a personal connection. Now, there's some good old boys. Now, Klugman was transferred to all things concerning Yugoslavia. He goes on to influence British high command to support Tito's Yugoslavian communist partisans over the Yugoslavian royalists, which paves the way for communist leader Tito's rise to power. After the war, Klugman worked as a journalist and historian having made a lot of that history himself. McLean's NKVD recruiter, Arnold Deutsch, was of Jewish descent, likely Hungarian. He was not known to be observant, but he claims he was. Now, he graduated from the University of Vienna and was very loyal to the communist cause. He worked with the liaison office of the Communist Party and specialized in recruitment. He seems to be the agent to come up with the plan to recruit upper-class students. They were drawn by their idealism and youthful rebellion, and most importantly, could infiltrate elite British society. Klugman, for the most part, remained openly communist, but when Kim Philby, McLean, and the other Cambridge crew were recruited, they were instructed to disavow their communist sympathies and past activities and even express fascist sympathies. Deutsch was recalled to the Soviet Union in 1937, but his work recruiting the Cambridge Five, starting with Kim Philby, was solid 
and they were handed over to a new handler. So why were these Cambridge kids good targets for recruitment? Well, there's some basic history and psychology here. As mentioned before, times of change, even arguably positive change, breed discontent, the churn. And as mentioned before, the wealthy have the time, money, and resources to think they can solve the world's ills. These kids grew up in the aftermath of World War I and during the Great Depression. They saw how the working poor suffered. They also witnessed the rise of fascism and likely were frustrated with peers sympathetic to that political spectrum. They wanted answers for life's ills and being of above average intelligence probably felt they could find them. Communist philosophy offered some promise of a better world and seemed to at least explain the world's economic ills and the seeming inevitability of war. Well, back to pre-war Cambridge. McLean attended Trinity Hall, Cambridge, along with Klugman. McLean studied modern languages. It seems that it was at Cambridge that McLean developed his left-wing political views. It was there he met and bonded with other future spies, Kim Philby, Guy Burgess, Anthony Blunt, and John Cancross. Our episodes on Kim Philby and Guy Burgess detail some of the college dorm escapades, so there's no need to rehash them here beyond saying they involved a lot of heavy drinking and promiscuity. Guy Burgess reputedly seduced Donald McLean, but McLean appears to prefer or have preferred heterosexual relationships. The idealist he was, McLean wrote for communist and left-leaning publications during his time at Cambridge. Topics he favored were equal rights amongst the genders, political activity on school grounds, and fears about the arms trade. McLean's recruitment appears to have occurred in 1934 by Kim Philby and the same year as Guy Burgess and his graduation. He was given the code name Orphan. His father had died his second year of university. I'm not sure if the code name was related. I would expect not. The purpose of a code name is secrecy. Why turn it into some kind of hint? After graduation, he joined the foreign office and stopped his left-wing literary career as ordered. He worked with the non-interventionist committee, faithfully passing information to his handler until his handler mysteriously stopped arriving. British intelligence had busted a Soviet spy ring and the Soviets had canceled contact with other agents. Still, McLean showed up to his meeting point loyally, as expected, for about a year. And, you know, nobody showed up. One day in 1937, Kitty Harris, famed Canadian-American Soviet agent who needs her own episode, was waiting for him at the meeting spot. She gave him the recognition code phrase, and their relationship began. It was much more than a spy business relationship. It was also a pleasure relationship. Kitty Harris reported to her handlers that they had sex before and after their meetings. He brought her chocolate and flowers. McLean was stricken with her. She was 13 years his senior. He was a true believer in the cause, as was she, and the tales of her experienced adventures no doubt inspired him. Their love affair was intense, as evidenced by a locket. When Kitty Harris died, she had few possessions, but one thing she kept was a gold chain and locket given to her by Donald McLean. In 38, McLean was made third secretary of the British Embassy in Paris. Harris and McLean both requested Harris be transferred to Paris so they could continue their relationship. This was granted. Despite his intense feelings for Harris, he had a wandering eye, or perhaps he wanted to settle down and knew it wouldn't be possible with his handler, who was rumored to be married to the American head of the Communist Party. 
Around January 1940 at the latest, in Paris, he met Melinda Marling. He fell for her instantly, and they were married soon after. When the Germans invaded France in 1940, uh, Harris fled to Moscow. She sent her handlers a telling final report on Donald McLean before evacuating. He is politically weak, but there is something fundamentally good and strong in him that I value. He understands and hates the rotten capitalist system and has enormous confidence in the Soviet Union and the working class. Bearing in mind his origins and his past, he is a good and brave comrade. The same could probably have been said about Melinda Marling. Her father and stepfather were both very wealthy Americans. Her mother saw that she attended prestigious schools in Switzerland as well as the Sorbonne in Paris. Like McLean, she had every reason to support the capitalist system. Her demeanor was reported as that of an attractive woman in pearls interested in little more than her friends and movies. She's not someone you'd expect to be involved in helping the Soviets expand their control and influence. With that in mind, there's some question as to how much Melinda knew about McLean's spying. For years, it was believed she had been duped. Since then, it's come to light that McLean probably had informed her early in their relationship. McLean didn't hide his relationship with Melinda from his lover and handler, Kitty Harris. He reported it to her, who in turn reported it to the Soviets. Soviet archives record that McLean told Harris about Melinda. She's a liberal. She's in favor of the popular front and doesn't mind mixing with communists, even though her parents are well off. There was a white Russian girl, one of her friends, who attacked the Soviet Union and Melinda went for her. We found we spoke the same language. Donald McLean and Melinda Marling married quickly. It must have seemed like fate to each of them. They were both aristocrats, yet communist. Maybe he wanted to impress her when he told her he was actually a spy. Maybe he wanted to test her. The story is she caught him making a drop and he just confessed. Whatever motive he had, they bonded and he received an ally. When McLean does defect to the Soviet Union, Melinda plays the part of the ignorant housewife. But archives reveal she offered to support her husband and not simply ignore his actions. On the surface, they seem like an ideal couple, but their marriage was plagued with problems such as infidelity and alcohol abuse. They married as the Germans were invading France, but did escape together to the United Kingdom. Throughout much of the war, McLean worked in London, focusing on economic warfare and natural resources. In 1944, he was promoted to second secretary of the British Embassy in Washington, D.C., and within the same year, he was promoted to first secretary. He served in this office until 1948. He had a reputation as a hard worker and was always there to pick up the slack for other embassy staff. He was was always volunteering to help. This made it possible for him to get access to information he might not normally have access to. Of specific importance was his work as Secretary of the Combined Policy Committee on Atomic Energy Matters. This allowed him to inform the Soviets about Anglo-American atomic development. His in-laws lived in New York, and he and Melinda frequented the city and state during his tenure in D.C., a fact that comes up later. He's likely the source that let Stalin know the Americans were behind on their atomic development goals and would have trouble delivering sufficient atomic bombs should a war between the Soviet Union and the U.S. break out. He also informed them that the Americans had only 27 bombers capable of dropping the bombs. 
This knowledge may have been what allowed Stalin to confidently blockade West Berlin and support North Korea during the Korean War. In 1948, he was promoted to head of chancery in Cairo, Egypt. Chancery in this case is basically a synonym of embassy. Chancery is literally an office where diplomatic work is done. He was the youngest such person to hold such a post up until that time. The stress of being in such a high position while working as a spy seems to have come at a great emotional cost. His drinking intensified. His Soviet handler expected him to meet in the Arab quarter, where he stuck out like a sore thumb. He's a tall, blonde guy expected to hand over envelopes. How is that not suspicious in the Arab quarter? McLean suggested to his handler that his wife Melinda should deliver the envelopes to the handler's wife at the hairdresser. McLean was even getting drunk and telling people he was a spy, but the listeners thought he was joking. Two incidents really stand out. And one, he and Melinda are going to take some friends and co-workers on a Nile River cruise. One of the boats didn't show up, so the trip was crowded and slow. McLean got smashed, and upon landing, grabbed his wife by the throat. He backed down, but later attacked an armed soldier, taking his rifle and beating him with it. A first secretary from the embassy tackled McLean and wrestled the gun from him. The first secretary's ankle was fractured in the process. In the other incident, McLean trashed a co-worker's apartment. His wife suggested he return to London to convalesce while she went off with her aristocratic Egyptian boyfriend for a vacation in Spain. Fair enough. All right. He returned to England and took some time to recover. He was able to fail upwards, and in 1950, McLean was put in charge of the American Department at the Foreign Office. He used intelligence from this office to report to the Soviet on U.S. General MacArthur's desire to use atomic weapons in Korea and England's stance against it. His nerve was gone again by 1951, and he was reported to be miserable in a bad way and anxious. He wouldn't have to be anxious much longer. The truth was soon to come out. With Project Verona, American cryptographers had decoded a number of Soviet messages. Some of these messages were deciphered years after being discovered. One such message, which originated in D.C., went from New York to Moscow. It also happened to have occurred while McLean was first secretary in D.C., a McLean who frequented New York City to visit his in-laws. The existence of Verona was made known to Kim Philby, Soviet spy and chief of British intelligence in D.C. Based on the content of the messages, he knew it was uh, just a matter of time before McLean was discovered. Getting word to McLean was problematic. He and Guy Burgess, also in D.C., came up with a plan. Guy would get kicked out of the country. Guy Burgess drove recklessly and managed to get three speeding tickets in one day. The governor of Virginia complained and the British ambassador had Burgess reassigned to London. In London, Burgess contacted McLean in person and explained both Moscow and Philby wanted him to defect. McLean discussed his options with Melinda, who advised him to go into exile rather than face charges. He took this advice and disappeared along with fellow Cambridge Five spy and brief college lover Guy Burgess. Before leaving, he tore a postcard in two and gave one half to Melinda and told her not to trust anyone unless they produced the other half. This was all at the time of McLean's birthday. Um, Melinda baked him a cake, they had a little party, and then McLean and Burgess drove to the coast, took a ferry to France, and disappeared. They didn't resurface to the world for another five years. Melinda, for her part, won the Oscar. 
She called the foreign office the following Monday to ask if her husband was there, as she hadn't seen him in a few days. They seemed to believe she was ignorant of the whole spying affair. This isn't the end of our, our story, especially for Melinda. She gave birth to Glean's third child three weeks after he disappeared. She played up the unsuspecting wife bit, but left England with her children. And they'd been bullied in school, so she relocated to Switzerland with her mother and enrolled her kids in the International School of Geneva. One of her children told classmates that their father was a hero who wished to stop war. So it appears as if Melinda did support her husband and his decision, or at least she told the kids a sweet tale of their father. She feigned ignorance to the children as to his whereabouts, though. They knew he was in hiding, but not exactly where that might be. But of course, she was keeping up the facade that she didn't know he was a literal spy. When asked if she'd go to the Soviet Union if her husband were there, she replied no. But with the death of Stalin, her attitude seems to have changed. In 1953, she told her mother that she and the kids were going to a friend's for the weekend. When she didn't return on Monday, her mother called the British Foreign Office. Melinda had defected with her children. The reunion meeting between McLean, Melinda, and the children was reputedly pretty awkward. McLean wasn't sure if she, he should embrace his wife or not. When the British press got word of Melinda's defection, she was dragged pretty heavily. So, what was McLean up to for those two years? Well, after being wined and dined upon arriving in Moscow, McLean and Burgess were shipped off to Kubuchev, a city about 600 miles east of Moscow. This was said to have been done to keep them safe, but was likely because they weren't yet trusted. McLean went to an alcohol detox center and learned Russian. Burgess drank more and looked for sexual adventures. McLean got a job teaching English. Burgess got his teeth knocked out in a street brawl. This isn't to say McLean was joyful. He was depressed and disillusioned, but appeared to be making the best of it. When his wife and children arrived, the kids were put in Soviet schools. Melinda was not thrilled with life in Kubuchia. Eventually, they were trusted enough to be allowed to move to Moscow. In Moscow, McLean became a lecturer, economic analyst, and magazine correspondent. He and Melinda had a nice apartment overlooking the river. They had a country home where the kids could fish and swim. Melinda translated kids' stories for an English paper. McLean tried to avoid other defectors as they tended to be disillusioned with life in the Soviet Union as well as their life choices. The previously mentioned former handler and lover of Donald McLean, Kitty Harris, would be one of them. Retired to the Soviet Union, though not in Moscow in her final days, in her diary, she questioned her life's work. We get a peek into the lives of the McLeans through Melinda's letters to her mother. And one she wrote, But believe me, I did the right thing and I don't regret it. Donald is well and happy to be with his family again. This is absolutely the best place for us. Life is good here in every way. McLean seemed to believe that Soviet society, or as he put it, new society, had a much better prospect than the old of overcoming the major ills and injustices of our civilization. McLean even defended the Soviet Union's crushing of the Hungarian uprising in 1956. That event turned a lot of communist sympathizers against the Soviet Union. For example, Samuel David Hawkins was an American-Korean War POW that opted to stay with the communists at the end of the war. Uh, the Chinese um, educated him, taught him Chinese, gave him a job, and he married a Russian woman who was living in China working at the Soviet embassy. 
that he defected with his wife back to the United States. When asked about his motivation for returning to the U.S., he cites the Soviet invasion of Hungary. In Moscow, Donald had meaningful work. The kids were growing. The McLeans had spent almost a decade there when Kim Philby, who had helped warn Donald McLean, was discovered. Philby was able to defect before being arrested. His defection occurred in 1963. His wife, Eleanor, joined him. McLean and Philby, old Cambridge buddies, back together again, but now in Moscow. The Philbys and McLeans became regular friends, drinking and playing cards together. Uh, Donald had taken up drinking again. Eleanor Philby commented that Melinda seemed anxious often. The Philby family suspected her marriage wasn't quite happy. Kim Philby wanted to help. He had also had a falling out with McLean, who accused Philby of being a British double agent. Philby began seeing Melinda on the side. When discovered, he told his wife, now, the poor woman has been miserable for 15 years. I'm only trying to make her happy. Eleanor didn't quite accept that, and she returned to the United States. Melinda moved in with Kim Philby, leaving the children with Donald McLean. Now, that was in 1966. Philby and Melinda stayed together for three years. Uh, Philby met a young woman and moved on while Melinda returned to Donald for two years before moving to her own apartment. She left the Soviet Union for good in 1979. Her kids followed her. She lived in the United States and refused to speak of her life. She died in her 90s in uh, 2010. 27 years after her ex-husband, Donald McLean. For his part, Donald seems to have enjoyed some level of prestige and respect in the Soviet Union. Uh, he defended dissenters and used his influence to protect them when he could. He expressed worry about Soviet society moving backwards. Eventually, it was the smoking and drinking that killed him. He died of pneumonia at the age of 69 in 1983 having been in and out of the hospital for some time with smoking and alcohol-related ailments. The lives of Melinda and Donald McLean were ones of contradiction, if not outright hypocrisy. Perhaps they'd made a Faustian deal with the devil in their youth and just could not back out. Perhaps they were true believers through and through. I'll close this tale with a recollection of Eleanor Philby. Melinda and her kids, you know, they stood out in Soviet Moscow. Not only did they have access to the stores of the Soviet elite, they received clothing packages from rich relatives in the West. They imitated, as well they could, the bougie life they had grown accustomed to. Yet, yet, Miss Philby said when they were getting rip-roaring drunk together in their luxury apartment on Soviet champagne, Melinda and Donald would talk about the good times they would have in Rome and Paris once the revolution comes. Thank you for listening. If you support independent media, subscribe, like, and share. Reviews and interactions help us greatly, so please leave a comment or a suggestion. Tell us who you want us to profile next. You can find us on all major podcast platforms. Visit our site at ciafiles.net. From there, you can easily add us to your socials, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and buy some of that sweet CIA Files swag.